That's why, why Proposition L was put on the ballot, was basically to force a planning regime back onto the city. So we, we went forward and gathered uh, 30,000 signatures in two and a half weeks to put this on the ballot. We want people to go out and talk to your community and let them know what's up and let them know LHN stand for loving your home and your neighborhood. Suddenly the, the good position was not the developer's position, it was not Willie Brown's position. It was the alternative, the neighborhood, the community voice. We had a lot of people and very little money. Um, and they had a lot of money and hardly any people. They had all the people money could buy. The plan for tonight is that everybody get a precinct um, to walk with these, these door hangers. They've thrown an awful lot of money and resources at us, so the only thing we got and the only chance we've got is for people to do this and to get out because we don't have the money to hire people to do phone calls and do the, the precinct walking that they're getting done um, through the two and a half million dollars they raised <laughs> to beat us. How many? Okay, I need to pick these guys up in 10 minutes, okay. so I'm going to take some slate cards. It's about 9.30 uh, on Election Eve. You know, we just uh, finished our phone bank. We got folks out dropping uh, door hangers right now. We've been trying to do everything that you can do, everything that a grassroots campaign can do in order to win a, an election. Obviously, we're going to do it with a lot, more, uh, a lot less money than our competitors. They're going to outspend us two to one, maybe even five to one. Decision 2000 election night continues. Here is Bob Kerr. I think L is, is going to be a disaster for the residents of this city because it will increase evictions, especially at the commercial level. Worst precincts have reported so far, so we still have an opportunity once we get 9 and 6 in, uh, Precinct 9 and Precinct 6. So we're cautiously optimistic at this point, but you know, there's still a pretty significant gap that we need to make up. Hey, okay, guess what, Daly? 34% Daly. Chris. No, get one. 25 of 50 precincts counted. Lots of screaming on the other end of the phone. Now I'm going to call that campaign headquarters. We lost by a slim margin, but the momentum and the activism and the organizing that was solidified through that campaign, um, what that helped do, among other things, was to elect a new progressive board, a pro-tenant, um, pro-community planning board. We are building what we've been thinking about, what we've been talking about, what we've been dreaming about, which is a serious, progressive people's movement in San Francisco that cares about our neighborhoods, that puts people first. So this is definitely a big move for us. It definitely gives us a lot of space and ground to work on, to keep progressing and to keep being productive and really, uh, you know, basically taking back our city. But at the same time, there's much more that needs to be done. Much more. I think that, that what has been so effective about the coalition that has kind of made the change in San Francisco is that it has operated on so many different levels. Sometimes we have to be really militant and sometimes we have to be really smart and use others, other tactics and use multiple tactics in terms of, of how we struggle with these entities. So you have people fighting outside the system and in, in the system at the same time with the same agenda that works incredibly well and we, we continue to need to do that even though we have you know, a majority of supervisors who seem to be in agreement with us, we need to keep doing what we're doing. Yo creo que una de las soluciones de raíz, de raíz, es la concientización de la comunidad. No solamente de la comunidad latina, sino que también la comunidad china, de todas las comunidades que están sufriendo este problema, porque es, toca varias culturas. Y de, el segundo paso es cambiar las reglas del juego cambiar las reglas de la política.
um, I don't think anybody really knew that even people that thought that it would come down that there'd be a correction thought that there would be a correction that it wouldn't just fall out the way it has I mean it's changing really fast now because 80% of the dot-coms have shut down and the unemployment rate is starting to rise 80% of the dot-coms are shut down yeah So that was another part of the suckers game, if you will, is you had the public mom and pop investor buying the stock that was just spun into the market, but you also had all these employees working away hoping that their stock was going to pay off. And in most cases that has not been the case. I had a rent check bounce, uh, which was not fun. I currently have uh, several uh, blemishes on my credit history because I wasn't able to make the minimums on the platinum card. I bought, I bought a house three months before I got laid off in San Francisco, which I paid almost $600,000 for at the peak. I mean, this is for a place that needed a new foundation, a new roof, and it was literally sliding down the hill during the rainy season. So this used to be bustling, huh? Yeah. This was... This was where I work. This was where my RCTO sat. Um, I've moved into the office because I deal with all of our records now and it's easier to keep it locked up. Um, and there's nobody here. I mean, the company's down to, it's me and we have um, our old IT manager. And that's what's left of the company. That's it. There is a sort of a feeling that, yeah, it's ending, but nobody really thought it applied to them. It took many, many months of shakeout until people realized, oh, it really is over. <laughs> Losing your job can help you understand that, too. <laughs> if yours is an adventurous spirit, you will want to go farther to see the ghost mines of the Motherlode country and to follow trails blazed by the 49ers in their search for gold. There absolutely was kind of a, a money grab slash land grab uh, gold rush mentality to it. During the great silver boom of the 1860s and 70s, when the Comstock load was booming out in Nevada, Virginia City, um, that couldn't have happened without a stock market. The stock market was established in 1862 in San Francisco. And the stock market was described by Robert Louis Stevenson, who was in San Francisco at that time, as like a giant pump, mining pump pumping the savings of the small investors from the flats up to the mansions on Knob Hill. The people who really got rich were the ones, many of them had never gone close to a mine. They were in possession of insider information transmitted at high speed by high, high technology, that is the telegraph. And the insiders were the ones who really got rich by manipulating the stock.